Okay, it's time to begin unit 11a on fluid statics. And so, so we see on the screen a fluid can be a liquid or a gas, something that moves. It's kind of a big volume that moves around. So we have to think about this a little differently than a center of mass that's moving like a point particle with some rotation around it. We have to think about Okay, what is this piece of fluid doing? What is another piece of fluid doing? And see how we can make sense of it. So that's how we're gonna start. And I'll make a little bit more of that later, but first, this intro. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, the topics for fluid statistics are density, pressure, pressure variation with depth, Pascal's principle, pressure measurement, and buoyancy. Ele module 11a, this one covers the first four, and then uh, when we start talking about um, <clears throat> measuring pressure and, and things moving, we get to the buoyancy force and Archimedes principle. Now, there's another way to think about this variation. When we're thinking about pressure and density, density is actually what's going to replace mass. Pressure is what's going to replace force. And so we're doing sort of a third round in this class, right? We already did the, the linear F equals MA and then energy to go with that. And then, and then we did the rotational torque equal I alpha is equivalent to F equals MA. And then the um, energy to go with that. <clears throat> and here we're going to get pressure is force per area. And uh, then we're going to, not really get such of an F equals MA rule uh, so much, um, but we're going to get a, um, a uh, energy formula, and we'll get it in two pieces, the pressure versus depth, sort of the, the first piece, you get that from kind of F equals MA analysis. And then when we get to buoyancy force, um, well, not but what the um, 12A, when we start talking about uh, the dynamics, then we'll actually get a, uh, uh, what the energy formula we're used to looks like in the case of fluids. <clears throat> That's going to be used for, for fluid dynamics. Right now, 11, chapter 11 is fluid statics, we're not to dynamics yet. Energy comes later. <clears throat> uh, the buoyancy force is going to turn out to be another uh, force to come into F equals MA. So we'll still be doing our free body or force diagrams. And uh, then uh, Archimedes principle is simply uh, how you get the magnitude of that force really. Okay, so pressure we define as the force per area. So we have a certain area of a fluid. You know, it can be the size of your hand if you're pushing against air or water. If you're swimming, you're pushing your hand against water, right? So you apply a pressure, force per area, <clears throat> and then that's transferred through the water and helps you push you along, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, the unit is Pascal, Newtons per square meter, and it also comes up in things like, you know, gas pushing against you. One atmospheric pressure uh, is 14.7 pounds per square inch, or in SI units, you know, uh, 100,000 pascals, 1.013 times 10 to the 5. <clears throat> and so pascal is kind of an inconvenient unit when we're talking about atmospheres, but that's our SI unit, so we're kind of stuck with it. And that's why I also often hear people talking about, you know, one bar, which, which is, you know, 10,000 pascals is pretty close, and, and other ways of trying to get around having to say times 10 to the fifth all the time. <clears throat> and pounds per square inch PSI is probably something you're used to from filling your car tires or, or reading pressure gauges that you might see and so on. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> force is spread over an area in a fluid. And so uh, if like sound, right? Sound, we paid a lot of attention to how much sound hit a certain area of the ear to get the power transmitted, right? Well, you equally can think of, oh, there's a fluid on the inside of the air, right? And that's getting this force over a certain area, and that's what matters for transferring. Actually, that's partly correct. It's not 
quite correct. But um, that's the kind of uh, idea that you can think about conceptually is that it's, you know, fluid pours past things, so is a gas. So if you trap it, it's the area you're using to trap it, it's kind of telling you about the pressure. <clears throat> And it says demonstrate pressure. So I guess we're gonna to have to do that. And I've got uh, two different uh, videos to show you. Let me pop over to do that. And so let's get to the right one here. Crush the soda can. That sounds like a demonstration of pressure, doesn't it? Uh, it's not quite what you think, probably. So let's see exactly what we had in mind. Okay, so we actually uh, put a little water into the can and then we heat it up. <clears throat> and you might ask, well, what are we doing here? It looks like chemistry. There's a Bunsen burner and a little thing to hold the can so you don't burn yourself. And the point here is that uh, a little bit of water in that can boils. And water vapor is a lot lighter weight, carries less pressure than. Uh, than air does. And also hot air, especially hot water vapor, doesn't have that much pressure. And if you cool water vapor, you get water. And so you'll get rid of that water vapor even. So what we're doing is we're filling the can with water vapor and we're heating it up. <laughs> and both of those are going to make it sort of less pressure if you close it off and cool it back down, right? And so if you see that pan next to it, that's got water in it. <clears throat> And so if we turn that upside down so that no air can get in, and if we uh, cool it down, then we're taking the pressure out of that can, much below atmosphere. And then what you do is you get to see, well, yeah, this really is pressure in the atmosphere, isn't it? Because it can do work. Doing work is force over emotion. Let's see if we see force over emotion here. Well, that scan is can is pretty squished there if we hop back. Um, I'll just stop it when the can squishes. And you see how fast that can is squished in here. That's work done by the atmosphere, which is a, a force per area, and it squishes down the, uh, the can because there's no balancing pressure on the inside. It didn't squish it before because there was atmospheric inside and atmospheric outside. It's only because we uh, quenched the water vapor down into the water and cooled the gas and reduced its pressure on the inside. And then the can doesn't withstand much of anything. It's a thin little aluminum can. <clears throat> okay, our next demonstration of the existence of pressure is something that you can use yourself to entertain yourself while you're stuck inside <clears throat> and your friends. So uh, this one, I believe, has some sound with it. Glass in the card trick. I fill the glass with water. place a small piece of plastic over the glass. Bring the glass out inverted, full of water, with the plastic card on the bottom. If I remove my hand, will the water fall out? The water doesn't fall out. The weight of the water is pulling down, but the atmospheric pressure is pushing back up. The atmospheric pressure being greater than the weight of the water holds the card in place but only barely. If I just tap the card, the water comes out. Okay, so uh, that's another demonstration of, yes, there's atmospheric pressure and it's pretty high. And so at this point, we'll uh, share over to our normal um, <clears throat> uh, camera here. And so let me do that. <clears throat> And here we are, back to the usual scribbles on a piece of paper that you're used to. <clears throat> uh, and I sort of took a slide here and I annotated it. <clears throat> uh, but <clears throat> first, what I was promising before, how does what we're doing with fluids tie back into F equals MA? <clears throat> That's what we know. Well, if you have a fluid, you just look at it chunk by chunk. So let's take a small chunk of fluid here. Let's take and make it a cube that says area A on every single surface of height D. Uh, and uh, V is the volume of it. A is the area of the surface chunk. <clears throat> D is the height. 
which we can actually make as tall as we want. Really only want the A here uh, to be horizontal and the D vertical. And then we can stretch it and do lots of fun things with it. So maybe it's not quite a cube. And the volume is simply D times A. Uh, now the force in the fluid as a whole doesn't make sense because it's just a big box. But if we push on this little piece of fluid here, we can, we can move it around. And uh, okay, we push for the force per area. Right, that's what we have available. And the, what's the mass of this fluid? Well, the mass um, <clears throat> is some little m, but that doesn't do it much good in this formula because what's more interesting is the mass divided by the volume or the density. And I'll show you why in a minute. So I think this density here is mass per volume. That's what we're going to use instead of mass. Instead of force, we're going to use uh, force per area. And so let's take F equals MA. Right? Replace M with rho times V. Uh, you can call it squiggly P, but it's really the Greek letter rho. It's more like an R. <clears throat> and so rho times V is the mass times A. And now uh, let's just take a small piece of fluid and uh, you can, um, well, no, this is, I don't take a small piece. This is the volume, right? The volume we got over here, A cross section D length. So that's D times A. Rho D A is density times the volume. And then we still have our acceleration here. <clears throat> and now we convert, instead of F, we want to use pressure, force divided by area. And if you look on the other side here, you have rho, that's replacing the mass, pressure, that's replacing the force. And then what replaces the acceleration is the height of this thing times its acceleration. Uh, so it's something with meters squared per second squared units. It doesn't have a real name, uh, but it relates to the change of fluid motion once you calculate all the forces. That's what happens to F equals MA. We're not gonna use this a whole lot, but we're certainly gonna use the idea of this and we're gonna use density a whole lot. <clears throat> okay, we already talked about the units of Pascal and these conversions before. So <clears throat> let's think about the atmosphere. Take this box. <clears throat> Take the height of the atmosphere for D, take the area to be, say, one square inch. What's the force going downwards? Well, it's the weight of the whole atmosphere, right? And so it's the uh, pressure times the area. And that, um, well, it's the weight of the atmosphere, but it's also the pressure times the area. And the pressure is uh, 14. 0.7 pounds per square inch, if the area is one square inch, is 14.7 pounds. So if we were all at school together, <clears throat> we have a bar of iron that weighs 14.7 14 14 pounds as a square inch from the bottom, you put it on your toe, and it hurts if you, uh, it's heavy <clears throat> for that amount of area. So that is a uh, important sort of point, is that we're being squished and the only reason why we don't squish into something little is because we have the same pressure on the inside where we have holes like, you know, digestive tract and so on. <clears throat> so uh, that is, our, um, that's how you can think of the atmosphere as just the pressure, is the weight of the air above. Now, pressure goes down as you go up. Why? Because there's less weight of atmosphere above. It's not a uniform uh, change of atmospheric density. Atmospheric density goes down as you go up. In fact, it goes down exponentially. We all have heard a lot about exponentials lately, so you know, one should have some idea what those curves look like. So the density goes down exponentially because there's less air above it. Um, it turns out why it goes exponentially has to do with energy and stuff that um, you probably could understand, but we're not going to get to this semester. The, um, <clears throat> But still, whatever weight it has, it adds up over that little column and gives you your atmospheric pressure. Now, if you think about pressure on a surface, 
really you have to think, as I just said before, why don't we squish? Because we have pressure on the on both sides. It's about the same atmospheric pressure. So you really have to think of this pressure inside minus pressure outside is what the force is on the surface. So whenever you talk about a force on the surface, we often say, oh, it's the pressure times the area. Well, really it's the pressure difference inside minus outside times the area that gives you the force. And so uh, if we blow up a balloon, for example, we put pressure on the inside and that blows up until the force on the surface of the balloon balances the pressure times the area on the inside or the difference in pressure across times the area, so to speak. <clears throat> and that's uh, how you get a balloon blow up. If you open up the balloon and let the pressure come out, because <clears throat> it had more pressure than air inside, that's how you get it big because the rubber has some elasticity. Then it all gets blown back out again because um, there's a force on that surface because there's more pressure inside than outside. This is bigger than one, it goes <clears throat> Okay, and we'll talk, and when we get to dynamics, we'll actually see how pressure can change locally and cause that to happen. So that's our general picture of what's going on. Now let's uh, think about uh, some principles of static fluids. First, pressure can only push. You can't pull with pressure. Uh, if you want to pull, you have to you know, build some mechanical apparatus to make the push into something that pulls. Uh, hydraulic cylinders, for example, a good example is how you, you put liquid on, on the back side so that you can push to make it pull, or you put it on the front side so that it uh, apparently pulls that sleeve back in. You have these things where you have a you know, a, a rod that gets pushed back in by the hydraulic pressure. Well, that's only because you actually put a thing here next to the rod, add fluid to push with it. So they're pushing in both directions. <clears throat> uh, one is it's called a double acting cylinder for those of you that uh, know the business. Okay, so um, when it applies pressure to the surface, the forces are always perpendicular to the surface. The reason why is because the pressure next door to where you're looking is the same as the pressure where you are. Pressure in the fluid is going to be the same pretty much everywhere, and so you're going to end up perpendicular because of basically symmetry cancels out. Uh, when a fluid is in a gravitational field, the pressure increases with depth. Why? I already hinted about this with the atmosphere. Pressure is the weight of what is above you, at least if you're in an open container. And so if you have atmosphere above you, certain atmosphere pressure, you go way up in the atmosphere, there's less atmosphere above you, less pressure there. Now you go under water, right? Water has weight that goes up a thousand times faster than the air's weight, right? Because water is a thousand times denser, liquids are about a thousand times denser than gases. And so you really notice it when you get down into the water. And in fact, you have a relation that the pressure in a fluid, if you say it's zero at the top, is rho g h, which is the distance up to the top of the fluid. Now for something like water, <clears throat> uh, there's so much pressure versus depth compared to uh, the weight of the atmosphere, the weight of the water is a lot, that you almost neglect atmospheric pressure or you measure relative to atmospheric pressure, which is what we usually do. We have something called gauge pressure that's relative to atmosphere. So, okay, this is, delta, this is really delta P and delta A, delta height. And so you get that, um, that coming in. But why this rho G here, rho G H, remember, is just the um, uh, mg divided by the volume. That's one part of the volume. The other part of the volume is area. Right? And area is pressure is force. Uh, per area, so pressure times area is the force. So this all comes back to the same, the same stuff we had on the on the last uh, on the last slide. <clears throat> so more principles of uh, of the um, <clears throat> static fluids. Uh, Pascal's principle is first. Well, not quite. 
This is related to Pascal's principles. Uh, pressure at any given height is the same. So if we go down here, pressure there, here's this fluid. This is, these are some little cylinder here and it's filled up. You got three, one, two, three, four open top things. You can see a little bit better down here, there's less arrows. So he poured some liquid into one, it filled up the bottom, it filled these all up to exactly the same height. It's gonna do that because of the same pressure. The only time it wouldn't do it is to get surface forces coming in if they're very narrow, capillary forces, you may have heard of those, but if they're big enough as these are, then it's the same height in all of them. And the pressure at the very top of all of them is atmosphere. And as I told you, if you're reading with a gauge, you read relative to atmosphere because atmosphere is everywhere. You don't really care about that. So if you subtract uh, the atmospheric pressure from the real pressure, you get gauge pressure. So subtract the atmosphere both sides, gauge pressure this side, zero on that side. And over here, <clears throat> the pressure inside here is the pressure from the atmosphere. Okay, that's the weight of the air. And then rho GH, where this is the water density, that's the distance down into the water. That's the pressure down here in the fluid. And so if you want to go to gauge pressure, it's absolute minus atmospheric, which is just the rho g h part. So the pressure inside a liquid, the surface of the earth, the gauge pressure down here is density of fluid, g distance down into the fluid. If you want the absolute pressure, that's relative to the vacuum of outer space, or the vacuum if you have a good vacuum pump, <laughs> and then you have to add the atmospheric weight above it because it hasn't been subtracted out yet. Okay, so uh, now some questions. What is the gauge pressure inside an open deflated balloon? Well, absolute pressure and there's the atmosphere, it's open. So if it wasn't the atmosphere, you'd get a force on it, right? Forces, pressure times area, there's some area in the open part. If there was a pressure difference, you get a force to push the air out. <laughs> so uh, it must be atmosphere in the absolute scale. Uh, but we want the gauge pressure. Gauge pressure is absolute minus atmosphere. In this case, atmosphere minus atmosphere is zero. So it's zero on gauge pressure. Absolute pressure would be one atmosphere. So keep in mind, whenever you're looking at a problem, is it asking for gauge pressure? Is it asking for absolute pressure? Because they differ, you know, this answer depends on it, right? It's this one if it was absolute, it's this one if it's gauge, that's what the question asked for. It goes back to the principle of read the question. <clears throat> okay, so let's take another example here. And I think we'll, We'll do it out. <clears throat> I forgot to print that. I don't have a good printer here. So a container is filled with water, which has a density of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter to a depth of 20 centimeters. We better draw a picture. It's starting to get too hard to follow. And uh, so uh, water. Is this iceberg? I guess it's, I'm gonna make water blue, right? Of course, make water blue. So there's our water. This is water. And it's filled to a depth of 20 centimeters. Why don't we convert that into meters right away? What's 20 centimeters in meters? I have to move it over to do, do, 0 0.2, 0 0.2 meters. And then, um, and this is a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And then, uh, let's see, oil to a depth of 10 centimeters. I'm not going to put any waves on the surface. There might be a few, probably not too many. Oil, and that's 920 kilogram per meter cubed to a depth of 10 centimeters, so that's 0.1 meter. And we want the gauge pressure at the top. And of course, it's P atmosphere out here for absolute, or uh, P 
P gauge equals zero. So right at the top is zero P gauge. <clears throat> at the top. Okay, so then um, the uh, let's start calculating down from the top, right? <clears throat> um, the pressure at the bottom is equal to the weight of the water. area plus the weight of the oil per area and uh, and then there's no atmosphere for gauge pressure and so the weight of the water Above us is rho water, uh, g h, depth of the water, plus rho oil, uh, g, just g is g, right, h oil. And that is equal to uh, 1,000 kilogram per meter cubed times uh, G is 9.8 meters per second squared. And H is 0.2 meters. And then we do the same for oil, it's 920. Uh, times 9.8 meters per second squared times 0.1 meters. And if you work it out, this is uh, 1960 pascals plus uh, 900 pascals. And that's um, equal to um, 2860 pascals. About, this is I guess 902. And that's 2862 if you want it to be perfect. <clears throat> Uh, so we get that as a function, uh, that is our, our value for the, um, uh, for this. Now there's another follow on, uh, right here. It's the same thing. What is the total or absolute pressure at the bottom? Uh, and to get here, we need to know um, <clears throat> the following rather simple rule. Uh, P absolute is equal to P gauge plus P. Notice I put the serifs on the bottom as it's a capital P for pressure. Like power is also a capital P. <clears throat> and uh, let's see the gauge pressure we just calculated. Uh, 2,862 pascals, this is from, just did, uh, plus uh, 101,300 pascals, that's the 1.013 E5 pascals equals P atmosphere. I just wrote it out so you can see that, okay, this has got four digits, that's four digits. So uh, it doesn't change it a whole lot. You basically end up adding three to this one and get um, uh, 104, uh, 1.04 E5 Pascals. And that's the other reason why we um, tend to use gauge pressure is that that's what we care about, right? We don't care about this, it's background, it's everywhere. And it's hidden because this is a reasonable pressure, but it's still small compared to the atmosphere. And this is 14.7 pounds per square inch. 
half what you put in your car tires, right? And you think of that as being reasonably high pressure compared to a bicycle tire that's a tiny fraction, right? So um, this is a, a fair amount of force you can get out of that. So um, at, um, gauge pressure is useful just for seeing what's important locally. Now at this point, <clears throat> I think it's a, a good time to, uh, uh, to take a, a slight break and show you some of my travel pictures. So <clears throat> I'll do that. And then you'll probably figure out why I'm doing that. So let's pop over here to, um, let me find where I'm supposed to be. Uh, Um, let's try this. Yeah. Oh, I see. I'm going to have to share over to that. You can just neglect what you're seeing. That's going to come up later. It just wasn't showing me the possible share because, uh, oh, here we go. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so went to New York and stayed in the San Marco Hotel in East 50th Street, <clears throat> sort of an older area, not too, too old though. And uh, of course I took the stairs on the way up. You can figure which floor I stayed on from the, from the uh, um, how high we go. This is floor two. And see, they happen to have a valve open here, right? When it's this way, it means it's open. And you can read the pressure off it. And so, of course, that's something you want to take a picture of whenever you go <clears throat> traveling, is if you get a chance to, you take a picture. And there's 100 here, so that's 110, 120, 130, 140, 150. This is a little over 130, if you uh, look at it. That's on second floor. Now we climb up to the sixth floor, and we read the pressure. and uh, it's now around 115. Again, it is open. I didn't open it. It was, it was open before. And so we hike up to the 10th floor and we look at the pressure and it's down to 100. And so we hike up a bit further. This is the 14th floor here. So I took the picture this way so you can make sure you saw the floor number. And this is the sprinkler pressure, by the way. They have these here so they can make sure that it's actually tested. But it also means that they're all connected to the same water all the way up and down. There's a tank on the roof. And here we're down to, it's 50, 60, 70, like 86 PSI. So it's right there, pounds per square inch. So it's right on the, on the gauge. By the way, do you think this is a gauge pressure or an absolute pressure? Well, given it's a gauge, and the type of gauge it is, it's actually reading gauge pressure. It's measuring pressure inside this pipe compared to pressure on the outside. Probably having a, a spiral bent up little uh, uh, metal thing in there, and when there's pressure inside, it tends to straighten the spiral out. And this attached to the end of it, so it bends more with the pressure. Okay, now we hike up to the 17th floor. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, look at the gauge, and up here it's down to 60, 75, about maybe 74. And <clears throat> you say, okay, what are we going to do with these? Well, we change our, our view over to the other share. <clears throat> we plot them, of course. And if I plot it, <clears throat> Here's the floor number. And we did the second, sixth, I guess, 10th, 14, and, and uh, 17. And we draw a line through it. There seems to, these two seem to be high, the last two. And I'd say, well, hmm, why are they high? Well, you think about it a little bit. I know why, because I climbed those stairs. And let me tell you why. Because in New York City, in hotels, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, 
there's no 13th floor. And so really, this one here shouldn't be at 14, it should be at 13, and this one shouldn't be at 17, it should be at 16, because in physics, we don't skip 13, no matter what your superstitions are. And so if I go and replot that thing, this is simply Excel. In, uh, with instead of 14, we use 13, instead of, uh, instead of um, 17, we use 16. Then they fall nicely onto a straight line, because now we're not doing any superstitions here. They might throw our data off. And uh, we find um, that um, the, uh, well, we have a beautiful line. The fit line has a slope of minus 4.08. And if you think about it, what does this number mean? Well, it's a slope, right? It's rise, it goes down, so it's rise is negative, over run. Rise is change in pressure, run is change in floor. And x is the floor number, so this is simply the change in pressure in PSI per floor. So that's minus 4.08 here. Uh, we're going to do this in English units. That's our official units in this country, so don't get mad at me. Uh, square inch is not official unit. Units are pounds, feet, and slugs for mass. Remember I told you that. So we want this in pounds per square foot, not pounds per square inch. And so if you do the conversion, which is essentially multiplying by 144, because you get a square, you get two of them to change, 12 each. Uh, so we have uh, minus 587 pounds per square foot per floor. Now the floor will be, if you think back, right, our pressure was a change in pressure. So P is equal to rho GH. We need the density of water. And density of water, if you look it up, you'll probably find it in pounds per square foot. But that's not the mass density, that's the weight density. We want the mass density, because that's what we're used to. So we need to convert it to slugs per square foot, and if you do that, you get about 1.95. Cubic foot, sorry. It's a density, it's per volume, which is a cubic foot. And our little g in English units is in feet per second squared, and it's 32 feet per second squared. So if you have delta P is equal to rho G H, and you want H, because what we're after here is what's the height of the floors, right? Then it's the change in pressure divided by rho G gives you H, divide both sides by rho G. And we now have everything we need here. Rho is the slugs per cubic foot. G is feet per second squared. Uh, there should be parentheses or dividing by both of those, of course and you get 9.4 feet. So this particular hotel had 9.4 foot floors. Now that's not floor to ceiling, that's floor to the next floor. Uh, it'll be a little shorter than that because it's by the thickness of the, of the physical floor or ceiling to floor, I guess you'd call it. And eight and a half to nine foot ceilings is very reasonable for a commercial building. So this is probably right on where it should be. Okay, so that is our, um, another example where we're using this pressure versus uh, depth. And uh, let's um, now hop back to our camera to continue on here. So share over to here. And so, um, okay, this is where we were. And now uh, let's um, uh, think about <clears throat> the next step. Right? That's all we're gonna do with pressure versus depth. Now we introduce hydraulics. Hydraulics, which I mentioned a little bit before, is all about Pascal's principle. And what Pascal said is that a change in pressure, now the change here is important because you know pressure depends on depth. We just did a few examples on that. We just did a sort of a measurement on that as it were in the San Marco Hotel to find out the height of their floors. <clears throat> but if we change the pressure at the top by amount delta P, then the pressure at any depth goes up by the same delta P. So this word change in pressures is 
really important. It's not saying the pressure is the same, it's the change in pressure in enclosed fluid is uniformly transmitted throughout the fluid. So if you increase it at the top, it increases everywhere. You still have that same pressure versus depth, you just have a higher pressure at the top, so to speak. And if it's an enclosed fluid, you can control that pressure. It's not always atmosphere. You can make it higher than atmosphere. You can make it lower than atmosphere. But whatever you do with it, it always um, changes uniformly throughout the material. That is Pascal's principle, and that's what we're going to be using. And a common place this is used is uh, in things like hydraulic lifts. And so <clears throat> suppose you have a, uh, a little pump over here has a certain area on its piston, applies a force. Okay, a force, you have an area, it's gonna make a change in pressure. Change in pressure, you know, if the force is delta P times A, then the force divided by A is change in pressure. So we make the pressure over here, force one divided by A one. That's the change in pressure. Now over here, underneath the car, uh, we're gonna get a force. And we have the rule, force delta P times A, right? Delta P is uh, the change in pressure from what it was before. So before we had some equilibrium, now we put a delta P, it does something over here. And we get, um, uh, for again, delta P over here is force divided by area. And if you get the force out, you multiply by the area and the force you get over here is delta P times area two. So if you think about it, the ratio of the forces, right? Small force, small area, gives you a big force with a big area. So if this is a huge area here compared to that, the ratio of the forces is the same as the ratio of the areas. Right. If you have a, <clears throat> a big area here, you get a lot more force. So suppose the ratio of these areas was 1,000, and this is a 2,000-pound car. Well, then you push with one pound here, and the 2,000-pound car goes up. That sounds like magic, doesn't it? <clears throat> I can push it a little bit, and I get a lot of it. And you might say, where is my comeuppance? I can't get something for nothing. Why can I push with a pound and get uh, and get a, a thousand pounds out of it? And the answer to that is down in this corner here. Work. <laughs> work is how much energy is done, right? Force times distance. So let's calculate out. Force over here at one times distance over here at one. Well, if the work's going to be the same on both sides, Force over here times distance over here is what it has to equal to. And here, um, you might say, well, suppose the work isn't the same on both sides. You put a question mark here. Okay, let's put an imaginary question mark there. Okay, uh, the um, force is equal to delta P times A on both sides, right? Force pressure times area. And so we can put delta P times A, delta P times A. The delta P is the same everywhere by Pascal's principle, right? that's the hydraulics. So it crosses out and you get A1, D1 is equal to A2, D2. Volume on size one, the change in volume is the change in volume on side two. That's the conservation of fluid. It has to be, if you move a certain amount of fluid over here, it has to go somewhere. It's an enclosed system, it goes over here, right? So if you say that this fluid has to be constrained, work your way backwards, which is not as obvious what you're doing, but if you did, then you'd find force times distance is force times distance. Or the work is the same on both sides. If the work is the same, the energy is the same, I'm happy. And there's your comeuppance too, right? If this is a thousand times the force of here, then you move one one thousandth the distance. So you push it over here an inch, it moves over here by one one thousandth of an inch. 25 microns, right? So it's nothing. <clears throat> And so uh, if you want to move this a foot, you got to move it a thousand feet over here. Well, that's a pretty long ways to go with a piston, a thousand feet, and that's why you have, you know, little pumps that pump some, hold the pressure, let you pump again, let you pump again, let you pump again, because uh, <clears throat> a thousand feet is a long ways to go, and often you might want to move this up, not one foot, but say 
10 feet, okay, 10,000 feet, yeah, you need a pump. And that's why you have these recycling pumps. If you go up and down with a hand pump a bunch of times, each time you're moving this a little bit, or you just have a, a motor turning a pump so it does it more continuously. <clears throat> but it is really working force per distance at the lower pressure because it's smaller volume. So that is the principle of hydraulics here. And you know, um, we'll put some numbers on this before we take off. <clears throat> so here's what it looks like doing a quantitative problem. <clears throat> okay, hydraulicless has a master cylinder. This is what causes delta P. Uh, with a cross-section area of 0.2 meters squared. <clears throat> so this is what we had been calling A1, and this would be delta P. It doesn't have a one on it because it's the same. Since it's the same everywhere. And a slave cylinder, that's, um, the one where the delta P is used. Well, the cross-section area of this, that would be a two. And a car 14,000 Newtons is on the slave cylinder. So this is F2. How much force must be applied to the master cylinder to lift the car? <clears throat> okay. Um, the um, you can say that delta P at one is equal to delta P at two. And delta P at one is equal to force per area, right? Force equals uh, pressure times area, or the delta that comes in and you get delta P is equal to force per area. So this is um, F1 over A1 is equal to F2 over A2. And we wanna know uh, force one, force one is equal to A1 over A2 times force two. And that is equal to um, 0.2 meters squared over 25 meters squared. 25 meters squared, that's pretty big. That's like a five meter radius, or well five divided by the square root of pi meter radius, square root of pi is around 1.7. So it's, you know, it's a couple of meters around, that's huge. <clears throat> but that's what the problem says. Times uh, 1400, 14,000, sorry, Newtons. And if you put that in the calculator, you get 112 newtons. And so that is this one. So that's how you do these things out quantitatively. You basically end up using uh, <clears throat> F equals pressure times area and solve it for what you want. Delta P is gonna be the same, so you normally end up setting the two delta P's the same and then run through the end of the problem. Uh, work, of course, as we talked about before, you get an F1 times D1 is equal to F2 times D2, but since the volume on the two sides is also the same, then uh, you come back to here. <clears throat> okay, so that is about all we have for part 11a. If you will go back to the beginning and saw what we're covered, we've sort of done those little pieces. And so we're gonna come back and uh, do pressure measurement and uh, buoyancy forces in the next lesson. So I will see you then.